Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You think that now that you have been here many days, you are part of the Mishpucha and you can talk while I speak? <laughs> Good morning. We are opening now the second plenary. And the second plenary this morning is really packed. It is packed with content, which reminds you that we are an institution of uh, excellence and higher learning, and this is the way we will start with the first part, the Kadar Family Award for Outstanding Research. Based on previous years, I remember how many times people left the room, uh, even though you were encouraged to stay in it, but you said, wow, and I'm sure that today you will say, wow. This is uh, the glimpse into the future outcomes of research. The second part will be coming back to our activities as a board of governors. We will have the formalities, resolutions, uh, reports, committees, and all the rest. And then we'll start the fireworks. The fireworks will be related to the process of uh, transition itself. The, everyone talks about Yossi's uh, extraordinary term, and uh, I understand we will extend it and we go slowly until the end of the session when you will actually ratify, depending how you like him, you will ratify the election of the search committee and uh, you will see how the next phase is being built. I want to only to know, those of you who need to leave the room at some stage, that uh, Yossi, uh, his chains are not going to be relieved. In other words, the only mechanism we have to tie somebody for the long term with us is to appoint him as governor. And as we appointed him as governor, there will be a peer pressure of all the family of governors who tell Yossi, don't dare moving anywhere. And so it is in this regard that we express the concept of continuity and change at the same. But let me start with the Kadar Family Award Ceremony. We have at the Presidium the President of the University, the Rector, Yaron Oz, we have Yoav Venice, the Vice President for Research. Those have been permanent fixtures in this particular session for a good reason, because the excellence of the university and its research reflect not only the work of the President, but the daily seven days a week, 24 hours a day work by the Rector, who is in charge of the academic efforts of our university, and you all have known and appreciated his contributions. So, with this in mind, I would like to invite Professor Klafter to set the stage, please. Good morning, so distinguished presidium, university leadership, Ms. Lindsay Bodner, uh, executive director of uh, the Naomi Praver Kadar Foundation. She's the representative of the Kadar family today here. Award winners, governors, colleagues and friends. I'll start with Mazal Tov, not because you are getting rid of me. This is because today marks the fifth anniversary of the launch of the Kadar Family Award. Uh, I remember that the award was um, founded by Dr. Avraham Kadar exactly five years ago when I started my second term and I viewed it, this is the way I wanted to feel, uh, that this is a present from the Kadar Foundation to me. I hope it continues, yes, it doesn't stop as a present to me. And uh, the idea behind the prize was that many of our excellent researchers do get awards everywhere in the world, in Israel, beyond Israel, but there should be an award which the university recognizes the uh, achievements of its excellent researchers. And this is how the prize started. And the prize is actually very inclusive. It's a prize that covers the campus at large in Tel Aviv, uh, I would say language, it's east of the campus and west of the campus. Hard sciences 
and uh, humanities, uh, social studies, uh, law, and, uh, and the rest. So uh, from this point of view, it's an annual recognition, very competitive. Already it's the fifth year only, but there are already people that are disappointed when they didn't, uh, don't get it, which is a good sign, by the way. It means that the prize was something. And this is, I, I would say, uh, uh, a very good step or, or uh, significant step that the university <laughs> is recognizing its own uh, uh, researchers. Now, the story of the prize itself is uh, actually an example of a friendship that led to an award. Dr. Avram Kadar and I met and realized that we are from the same hometown, Rishon Lezion, by the way. And uh, moreover, uh, when he was in high school, it was more or less when my wife was at the same high school. So uh, the connections are very, very, uh, I would say, tight, and I would say even a step. Beyond it, Dr. Kadar is a graduate of the Sackler School of Medicine. Uh, two weeks ago, Einati's daughter got her degree, MD degree, at the Sackler School of Medicine. Uh, the son, Nadav, uh, graduated our, uh, got an MBA from the uh, Kohler School of Management. And Maya, I think, uh, graduates of, grad, she is a graduate of the Faculty of Art. So the whole family is a product of Tel Aviv University. And this is how uh, the alumni to be, and not to be, they are all alumni now, uh, uh, are, are connected to us, and the prize is, uh, I would say, an outcome of this. So, Lindsay, I hope the prize continues. I'm not negotiating here. I'm, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think it's something that is uh, uh, very significant. Send my regards to the family, or our regards to the family, and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Klafter. Um, thank you, Chairman Frankel. Thank you, Governors. Uh, it's really my honor to be here today uh, and joining you at the Second Assembly. I want to thank the Selection Committee, who had the very difficult and exciting task of choosing today's remarkable recipients of the Kadar Family Award. Uh, and I also want to thank the many people who put this presentation together, um, especially Barry, Inbal, Sharon, Anat, um, and uh, Fleur Hassan Nahum, who is our presentation coach who worked with, uh, with, with our recipients today. As the executive director of the Naomi Prower Kadar Foundation, I'm pleased to represent our founding board, Dr. Avram Kadar, Maya Kadar Kowalski, Nadav Kadar, and Anat Kadar Kriheli. Um, the foundation exists to honor Naomi's legacy and continue her life's work dedicated to education and Yiddish scholarship. We do this by supporting innovation, innovative educational initiatives as well as Yiddish in academic settings. Naomi taught Yiddish around the world, including at the International Yiddish Summer Program at Tel Aviv University, which now bears her name. As a foundation, we also support scientific and medical research, including through the Kadar Family Award today, and through the Tel Aviv University Global Research and Training Fellowships uh, that subsidize research visits by medical and life scientists and engineers um, to, to travel to laboratories worldwide <laughs> and learn skills and, uh, and new technologies to be able to bring them back to Tel Aviv University. We are here today to honor outstanding research and scholarship in the sciences and humanities and celebrate the pioneering spirit and hard work necessary to change the world. When we initially defined the selection criteria, as President Clafter mentioned, we, we felt that it was really important to represent both sides of the campus and also to, uh, to honor incredible uh, um, achievements in teaching as well as in research. Beyond her scholarship, Naomi was deeply invested in personal mentorship and helping her students re reach their potential. That's why we ask our laureates to present to the Board of Governors in this forum and to produce short TED-style videos that encapsulate their work, which will be shared widely. Communicating their discoveries to students and to the greater community elevates the profession of teaching while making cutting-edge research accessible to all. The Naomi Foundation President, Dr. Avram Kadar, has also asked me to share brief personal com comments in absentia. So I'll read, I'll read from his, uh, his remarks. 
Dear fellow governors, I regret that I am unable to join you for this second assembly, which is truly a highlight for the Board of Governors meeting. It recognizes an elite group of scholars and researchers doing groundbreaking work across disciplines, imparting new ideas, and encouraging new ways of thinking about existing challenges. President Clafter has always understood the importance of taking a balanced approach to promoting excellence in technology and the sciences while prioritizing the humanities. He personally approached me with the idea to create the Kadara Family Award, and I am so pleased that the program has now been in existence for five years. On this occasion, I would like to express my gratitude to Yossi, both for his vis visionary leadership of this university and for our friendship. Tel Aviv University has always excelled as an academic institution, though it has truly flourished under Yossi's stewardship. It has become the crown jewel of Israeli academia, a world-recognized leader in innovation and a hub for entrepreneurship, research and development, and international collaboration. In this forum, I want to recognize Yossi's immense contr contributions, which have set TAU on a trajectory of continued growth. He has done this all with characteristic wisdom, integrity, and understated grace. As a TAU graduate and the father of TAU graduates with advanced degrees in film, business, and medicine, I am proud and optimistic for the future of the university and Israel. I congratulate the recipients of the Kadar Family Award on reaching this career milestone. We will continue to follow your work with great interest. Mazel tov. Thank you and be well. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, these kind words. Let me now invite uh, Professor Yoav Hennis, who is the Vice President for Research and Development and Chairman of the Kadao Family Award Committee, to present the 2019 recipients. The floor is yours. Thank you, Yaakov. Welcome, everybody. And I'm uh, very glad uh, to be in this uh, annual uh, ceremony of the awards of the Kadar Prize. And the Kadar Prize is really for achievements in uh, research. And we are choosing two people, uh, two researchers uh, in the uh, hard sciences and two researchers in the softer sciences, the humanities as such. And uh, uh, one of them in each category is senior that is over 10 years in the university, as one is of the younger uh, generation, that is up to 10 years in the university as an independent researcher. And the committee always has a very difficult task, as it had also this time, and uh, be, a hard task, not because it is hard to find good researchers, but it is, there are so many good ones that it is very difficult to choose uh, between someone who you grade 99 and someone who you grade 98, okay? Uh, which depends also in many cases on personal taste uh, for science. So, I will start uh, with... Uh, uh, the hard sciences part and with the senior and uh, the senior uh, the winner in the the awardee in the senior category uh, this year is uh, professor Danny Cohen O of the Blavatnik School of Computer Science in the Faculty of Exact Sciences now since he is in computer so you know uh, a group of uh, students was given a task by uh, the lecturer, the, the, the lecturer divided them into a group of men and a group of women, and each of them should define whether computers are male or female. So, the male group said computers are definitely female. There is no argument about it. Now, why? So, one, no one but their creator understands their internal logic. <laughs> Two, the native language they use to communicate with other computers is incomprehensible to anyone else. Three, even the smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for possible future retrieval. Okay? And four, as soon as you make a commitment to one, you find yourself spending half of your paycheck on accessorizing it. Now, uh, the female uh, group of students said, no, computers are definitely male. There is no argument about it. Now, why? 
They also had four reasons. One, in order to do anything with them, you have to turn them on. <laughs> Two, they have a lot of data, but still cannot think for themselves. <laughs> Three, they are supposed to help you solve problems, but half of the time they are the problem. <laughs> and four, as soon as you commit to one, you realize if you would just wait a little bit longer, you could have gotten a better model. <laughs> so, uh, Danny Cohen O is not the one who divided them into these groups, but he got the prize for something else. Uh, and he is, he is awarded uh, the prize for his groundbreaking work in the field of visual computing and specifically computer graphics. These contributions are recognized worldwide as most influential in the field and earned him the prestigious ACM Seagraph Computer Graphics Achievement Award in 2018, which for the very first time was awarded to a researcher outside of the US. He has authored over 200 scientific articles, was awarded multiple competitive grants, and educated a large number of students. Thank you very much. Okay, so under the category of junior faculty awardee in sciences, uh, the awardee is a Professor uh, Oded Rehavi from my own department. This is not why he got the prize. Uh, in the School of Neurobiology, Biochemistry and Biophysics in the Faculty of uh, Life Sciences. So Oded uh, is a geneticist and molecular biologist and cell biologist. So, you know, about geneticists, there are many stories. Some of them I've used before, so I hope I did not use this one. So there is a guest that came to Oded's lab, and they are sitting in his office and uh, discussing science. And all of a sudden, the guest sees something running very quickly by the window. And he says, I don't realize there's something very strange, he says to Oded, that passed by the window. What is it? I think it, it seemed to me like a four-legged chicken. Is that true? And Oded says, oh, yes, oh, yes. This is part of an experiment that we are conducting. He says, why? He says, well, we decided to develop a four-legged chicken because you, it's very uh, uh, good economically. You know, it's connection also to remote and to... Uh, applicative uh, research, uh, because you can get twice the drumstick per chicken. So it's very profitable. He says, wow, that's an interesting idea. And how do they taste? He says, we don't know. We cannot catch them. <laughs> and another development, another development was also, you know, because it is so difficult to pack the eggs because they are round and you need all this. So to develop a chicken that lays square eggs. And then it's very easy to pack. You just place them on one another. But this one did not materialize, did not pass. You know why? Because uh, the uh, vad uh, of, the, of the chicken objected. OK, so Oded. 
Oded uh, was selected uh, for the Kadar Family Award for his unique contribution to the development of new areas of research and especially his studies on the role of small RNAs in epigenetic and inheritance, a field that Oded had, contri had greatly contributed to and shaped to a significant extent. He has unusual inventive ideas as exemplified in the scroll story with uh, Mizrahi. I don't know if you know it, but this is uh, a story that everyone in the university likes to tell, where Oded collaborates with uh, uh, Noam Mizrahi from uh, biblical uh, studies, who studies the scrolls of the Dead Sea. And the idea was that the uh, Oded is sequencing the DNA of the scrolls to fit the pieces, because it's from sheep skin, so you can fit which sheep it came from, so you can fit the uh, pieces together. And for that, they got a grant from Google, and I understand that from the Schmidt Foundation, sorry, and where is Stu? Stu should be here. So the Schmidt Foundation, and uh, actually, if I understand correctly, there is a paper in under review right now, under revision in uh, Nature. So we are looking forward to see. It. And uh, another example is the use of Toxoplasma gondii parasite, which quells cat fear in mice for drug delivery to the brain. This is an interesting story also that Oded may mention a few words on, uh, on when he's, uh, you are not. So, <laughs> one word, the cats get this parasite, and the parasite develops in the cats, it doesn't do anything to the cats. But then, it's transmitted to mice. Now, in the mice, it causes loss of fear from cats, so the cats can eat the mice. And then, the parasite grows in the cats. And Oded is using proteins from this parasite to help uh, uh, place, uh, uh, enter uh, compounds into the brain, because the blood-brain barrier is a real barrier, so really ingenious uh, ideas. Not less important, not less important, Oded is an excellent teacher, uh, uh, an excellent teacher, and uh, got the Rector Award in teaching, and is highly valued met mentor to his many, many MSc and PhD students, I think about 30 of them, am I right? More or less. So, Oded, please. So, uh, we are moving to a senior faculty awardee, humanities, excuse me that I'm running, but you know, we have a long session, so I cannot uh, waste too much time. So, uh, the awardee in senior faculties, in a uh, senior faculty awardee in humanities, it goes to uh, Professor Tamar Herzig from the School of History, the Faculty of Humanities, and uh, she's uh, studying history, but she's tying together social, religious, and art history. So, uh, about religion, there are also uh, uh, many stories. I can only tell you one of them, which I think also fits today, Yossi, because I think Yossi feels that way uh, regarding... Talking about God. Uh, of course. But you know, you know, you know what is the difference? Not a, not a joke that I planned. But you know what is the difference between God and lawyer? Hmm? God doesn't think he is a lawyer. <laughs> anyway, anyway. So the religious jokes which relates, and you will see why, to uh, what will happen with Yossi now that he lives, is that there is this, in the Jewish community, there was this uh, uh, Jew that uh, had many problems and was a real nag. And he used to come to the rabbi every day and call him on the phone and really, 
drive him crazy. And then, uh, after like a year of constant nagging, the rabbi said to him, you know, I think I found a solution to your problems. He says, what? He says, convert to Christianity. He says, will this solve my problems? He says, no, but you will be nagging the priest and not me. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Professor Herzig uh, is named uh, for the Kadar uh, Prize for, as I said, her work in history, tying together social, religious, and art history. She focuses on two major research lines. Uh, the first is Jewish conversion in Renaissance Italy, and the second is uh, female Jewish converts in early uh, modern Italy. Tamar is an internationally admired expert in these fields whose publications are of great interest and highly recognized. Tamar. I can feel like Madonna now. <laughs> I just need the patch on the eye. Last, last but not least, uh, junior faculty awardee in uh, humanities, and uh, the awardee is uh, Dr. Uh, Ayala Arad from the Kohler School of uh, Management. And uh, you know, because um, uh, it's on a connection between psychology and economics and so on, so I was thinking uh, which joke to come up with. And there are, two, there are too many on psychology, so I decided to this time to go for economy. So uh, uh, there is a, uh, an opening for an, a, a high standing uh, position, and uh, there are uh, three candidates. And uh, they go for an interview with a committee. And uh, the first one that goes in is a mathematician. And he is asked by the committee, someone in the committee, a very simple question. What is 2 plus 2? And he says, 4. So, are you sure? He says, exactly 4. OK. He leaves. Uh, the other one uh, enters uh, the room. And um, uh, this. Uh, other guy is an accountant. So he is asked, uh, how much is 2 plus 2? And he says, 4 plus minus 10%, and we can negotiate maybe. <laughs> OK. Are you sure? He says, of course, maybe 15%. <laughs> After that, so he goes out, and the last one that comes in is an economist. So he is asked, how much are 2 plus 2? He goes to the door, closes it, comes to the committee and whispers, how much would you like it to be? <laughs> so, Dr. Arad is named for the Kadar Family Award for her outstanding contribution to the study of psychology and economics, behavioral economics, and experimental economics. These encompass three research fields. The first is reasoning in games, the second is psychological elements in choice, and the third is liberal paternalism. She is defined as a rising star in these fields, and her studies had an international impact. For example, her work on the Colonel Blotto game launched a project on multi-dimensional multi reasoning in games. The Nobel laureate, laureate uh, Reinhard Selten, congratulated her on this paper in his letter, uh, calling it a breakthrough in bounded rationality. So Ayala, please. So now we listen to the lectures. OK. 
Okay, good morning. Uh, it's a honor to be here with you, the Kadar family, receiving this award. It's an award from a family or a strong supporter of the university. So I was always inspired by graphics, uh, probably because my father was a graphics designer. And he, as you can guess, he was a designer for the old school designers. He'd make his art with a pen and paper. And nowadays, and nowadays, And, uh, yeah, okay. and nowadays everything is, uh, is done on computers, but one question remains. Can computers be creative? And I mean really creative. Not that I know exactly what creativity means or I know the answer, but you will see how it relates to what I'm doing. So I'm doing computer graphics, and uh, I think that all of you associate computer graphics with the, what we see in entertainment, the amazing movies and the video games. And indeed, computer graphics did a huge progress in the last 30 years. And nowadays, we can say that uh, we can do, can generate images like this very easily. I would say this, all, these images are photorealistic. They look like real, like this one or like this one. It's true that if you come to a professional, a professional will ask, uh, can tell whether it's an, a synthetic image or a photograph. But generally speaking, I would say that computer graphics passed that what we call the graphics Turing test. So it's a test whether something is synthetic or real. So maybe the new challenge is the, what is referred to as Lovelace the test. She claimed she's considered to be one of the first uh, programmers before the invention of, of, the, of the computers. And she claimed that computer cannot create, cannot be creative, because only human can. Because they can do only things that they are being programmed to. So what really separates human and machine is the ability to create, to be creative. Look at these, these, for example, these uh, logos. Each one of them has a visual metaphor that expresses something, some meaning of the text. Yeah, look at, uh, look at, oh, sorry. Look at the word here, hide. You see the hide is hidden behind the, the H, or here the B of the birds become a bird. That would be extremely difficult for a computer to do, or I would say even today, not possible. So let's look at this image. It's from the seventh century. Here, the, the painter made a huge effort in order to simulate all the illumination effect, the, the light coming from the window, the, the shadow, the shading, and everything to make the, this image look real. Nowadays, with a camera, we can take a photograph and get it very easily, right? So we can say that the camera released the artist from the need to paint realistically and open the way to, for the artists to be more creative. And they really come up uh, after the invention of the camera with this kind of uh, style like impressionism, expressionism, and cubism, and so on. So we can say that the camera released the artist from the need to be accurate. But the question is whether a computer can release the artist from the need to be creative. So probably the answer is currently no. But what we have been doing in the last 10 years in, in my lab, we, in, we, we, we developed the notion of inspiring modeling. So in inspiring modeling, the, the, the computer helps the, the user to be more creative or to come up with ideas that maybe will envision, that the artist didn't envision and will inspire him. So we come up with in, new ideas. For example, here in this work, we navigate to what we call in a transformation space for it. So we take uh, this image on, on the left here. Sorry. Yeah, this one, it's colorful, but we want, maybe we want to, to recolor it. So we generate automatically and present a gallery of different colorization to the user so that it can be maybe inspired and, and navigate to the, to the colorization that he likes. Or for example, here we call it more of the same, but in a, in a good sense, that we take uh, the input image, uh, or models in this case, these models, and then we learn the commonality and generate more more of the same, but each one of them is different, and one of them might again inspire the, the, the user. Or here, we do it interactively, we take a 3D model, if you recognize this is the Akira of model in Tel Aviv, and we generate quickly very different variation, all of them share the same style. Yeah. Sorry. In another work, okay, these are more example of 3D buildings where we generate all kinds of variation of, of, with the same style. And in this work, we, we develop uh, not an individual object, but a, a set evolution. So we, we develop a, a pop, an entire population of objects, like you see here, these lamps. 
it's biomotivated, it's the, follow the, the idea of the survival of the fittest. So we create a lot of models through the generation and present again to the user uh, a gallery. He, 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 he selected the one that he likes, these are the ones that fit, and then it will dominate the next generation. So after a lot of generation, the hope that some of them will be unexpected. We, we keep the diversity of the, the population all the time, and we hope to get some, some models like this one are considered to be unexpected and probably inspiring. Just one more example. These are this set, we call them TV alien, where we start from an input set, and then through the generation they become more and more interesting and uh, hopefully, as I said, inspiring. So I very quickly went through some, only a glimpse of what we are doing in our lab, uh, in the computer graphics lab, and I'm proud to say that we are a leading team in the world. And the question remains, can computer be creative? And so far, we are only able to generate some tools to, to inspire the, the artist or to, the human to be more creative. And in the future, who knows, the computer can be really creative. Thank you. First, I'd like to, to thank the Naomi Foundation and the Kadar family. I'm very humbled and honored to get this uh, prestigious prize. And second, I would be very happy to tell you about the different things that we do in the lab, but I'm limited in time, especially the four-legged chicken would have been very, a good story to tell. But today I'll focus on uh, one topic which is main, probably the main thing that we do, which is uh, uh, epigenetic inheritance. Inheritance uh, that's mediated not by DNA, but by other heritable factors. And it, this affects everything that we, we know in biology, including evolution. And I'll start from the evolution because this is the, the, the beginning, really. So, uh, as you probably all know, the credit for the theory of evolution goes to Darwin, and deservedly so. Uh, but before Darwin, uh, there was another person, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, with a forbidden name you can't tell to biologists. It's a heretic name. Uh, and, and, but he published a, a, a full theory of evolution 50 years before Darwin, and Darwin was well aware of it and even uh, believed in it. He even added a sort of a Lamarckian mechanism to the sixth version of the origin of the species. The difference between the two and the reason that Darwin gets the, the, the credit is that Darwin came up with the right mechanism of, of, of how it works, and I'll uh, briefly, briefly explain it by, by going to, to explain the, the giraffe's neck. This is the most famous example. So according to Darwin, the giraffe got its long neck because uh, at some point there was a giraffe that was slightly different. It had a longer neck, and so only this giraffe could eat uh, from the treetops when they were high in the savannah in Africa. The rest died, and because of the, the, the giraffe survived, the one with the long neck, uh, its genes, of course, Darwin didn't know of genes, its genes took over the population, and we, we have giraffes with long necks. And according to Lamarck, and this is the wrong theory, uh, the giraffe using some vital internal forces extended its neck towards the trees and uh, got to eat and passed on these genes that it acquired during its lifetime or these abilities it acquired during its lifetime to the next generation. Because we don't have a mechanism for extending limbs at will, this is considered to be completely wrong. And, you, and inheritance of acquired traits is a, is a dirty word. Technically, the reason that you can't do Lamarckian evolution, that you can't inherit acquired traits, is that uh, that the, the cells of the germline that contains the genetic material, the DNA, are segregated, isolated from the rest of the body. The body that actually, the body cells that actually interact with the environment. So, for example, if you get a mutation from the sun in your skin, there's no way to translate this mutation into a mutation in the sperm or the egg, the germline. And therefore, what happens in the soma stays in the soma and changes to the body are not inherited. And this is true, and this is how DNA works. However, there could be other mechanisms, this is what we study, that do allow transmission of responses from bodily cells to germ cells, and therefore also perhaps uh, environmental responses across generations and even inheritance of acquired traits. And, uh, and so, for example, when they, when they sequence the human genome, when they finish sequencing it at, at uh, 2001, we were surprised to find out that humans have 20,000 genes, but worms, 
the one that we study in the lab, have only, also 20,000 genes, and corn has 40,000 genes. So it's obviously not all in the number of genes, it's how you use them and how you control them. And what we found in, in what we discovered in the lab is a new mechanism for transmission of responses between generations or inheritance memory, which is not mediated by changes to DNA. It's mediated by other molecules, which are more ancient actually than DNA, RNA molecules, a specific set of RNA molecules that uh, we now know can move between cells, including from the cells of the body to the germline. These are called small RNAs. We know a lot about the mechanism now. Um, so, for example, we know that there are eight different transporters that shuttle the RNAs, the small RNAs between cells, including from the soma to the germline. And this is work that's done in C. elegans first, but I hope C. elegans is, a, uh, I forgot to say, it's a nematode, it's a, a type of very small worm, it's only one millimeter long. But we can learn a lot about evolution and genetics using this worm and also about neuroscience because uh, it makes another generation every three days. So you can quickly study many worms and also uh, understand, uh, and, uh, and also if each worm produces hundreds of babies. So you can do the statistics. And I remind you that genetics started from work on peas and on, on flies, and we hope that, that worms would be the, the, would be the peas or flies of epigenetic inheritance. So what we've shown first is that worms can transmit memory of viral infections across generations that protects the next generation. What we, what we did is we took a worm and we exposed it to a virus. And the worm produces RNA, small RNA molecules against the viral genome that destroys the viral genome. And this is happening through a process that's called RNAi that was discovered in worms just a few years ago and awarded its discoverers with the Nobel Prize in 2006. Then it was found to be conserved also in many other organisms. By the way, worms are not that weird. Since 2006, Nobel Prizes were awarded to worm researchers. So if you infect, if you infect the, the worms with uh, viruses, they produce these RNAs against the virus, and, and this protects them against, against viral infections. But what we found is that the worms also shuttle these small RNAs to the next generation, so that the next generation is already born protected against the virus. So this is an inherited memory of immunity. And it's mediated by, by small RNAs, and this is the first time that this was shown. And so if you infect the next generation, they're already protected. Then we went to study uh, uh, whether diet, or specifically starvation, can produce these transgenerational epigenetic responses through small RNAs. And the first thing that we studied is starvation, because starvation is the most um, studied epigenetic effect in humans. So in the, in the second, during the Second World War, the Nazis sieged large part of, of the Netherlands uh, for six months. And there was a, a food ratio, no one ate more than 800 calories a day. And it has been shown that the descendants of the starved individuals suffered from all kinds of diseases, such as um, um, diabetes and also schizophrenia and other diseases. And Audrey Hepburn was, a, as a kid, starved at, at, at this time. But the mechanism is, of course, completely unknown. It's very hard and unethical to study this in, in, in humans, but we studied it in worms. And we've shown that if you, if you starve worms, if you put them on, on foods without uh, food, compare them to worms which are growing on food, uh, on, on plates with food, then, then if you follow this, the, the descendants of these, of these uh, starved worms, you see that they inherit small RNAs from their parents that regulate the expression of nutrition genes and also control the longevity of the worms. So if, if they come from descendants of starved individuals, they live almost twice as long, and they are also more protected from additional rounds of starvation, which is more harsh. And uh, over the years, we studied the mechanism of how this is happening, and we found that the, the, the duration of the heritable response is also very tightly controlled. So if you start an epigenetic in effect in worms, it lasts for three to five generations exactly. This was referred to by the Nobel Prize winner, and, and, and Andrew Fire, as the bottleneck to RNAi inheritance. And it wasn't clear how this is happening. People thought maybe it's just the, 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 the molecules dilute over generations. But we've shown this, this is not the case, that there is a, a, a dedicated pathway, a mechanism that controls the duration and makes sure it's just three to five generations. We call it the transgenerational timer, and we define all the genes that make up the pathway. So we call these genes MOTEC genes. MOTEC stands for Modified Transgenerational Epigenetic Kinetics. And by, by mutating these genes, by changing their, their function, we can control the duration. So, for example, we can produce worms in the lab that inherit these responses forever, for tens or hundreds of generations. Unless this is something that, which is now in press, it's not published yet, will be published next month, which is maybe the, the holy grail of, of this field, we've shown that the nervous system of these worms can produce responses that change 
the, the fate or the, the destiny and the behavior of the next generations. So we found how the nervous system in the worms communicates with the germline to generate these transgenerational responses. And I'm saying this is the holy grail because the nervous system is very unique in its ability to plan and also coordinate bodily responses and responses to external and internal environments. So the idea that it can somehow lead or, or direct the, the next generation's uh, uh, fate is, is really stunning. And uh, the, the hope, of course, is that this will be uh, conserved in humans. We don't know this is the case at all now. This is still basic work using these model organisms. But we hope they would be conserved like other processes that have been discovered in worms. And if it would be, then it could have uh, significant um, uh, effects or implications. Because at the moment, every couple pretty much in Israel that goes to have a baby does genetic <coughs> testing. And at the moment, you study a few genes, but soon you'll study the entire genome. But you ignore the whole level of heritable small RNAs that also affect many things. For example, in humans, perhaps diabetes and schizophrenia. We don't know this is the case yet, but it has great potential. So, so this is, I'd just, just like to thank all of you for listening, and specifically uh, the, the Kadar family. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a great honor to be here, and it's a great honor to represent the Faculty of Humanities. Now, I'm actually a specialist of gender history, so I have my own take on Professor Hannes' joke on computers, but I'll save that for another occasion. And what I will be talking about today is my research, um, which combines religious and Renaissance history. Now, uh, Renaissance and, and religion are often perceived as contradictory terms because the Renaissance is sometimes perceived as the period of transition from the Middle Ages to modernity and as laying the foundations for secularization and humanism. When you dig deeper, though, you find a dark side of the Renaissance, one that was profoundly religious, intolerant, and even persecutory. The era of Donatello and Leonardo also saw the onset of ferocious witch hunting and the oppression of minorities. As my research reveals, it was during the heyday of humanism that a growing number of Italian Jews were compelled to convert to Christianity. I began by studying nuns and discovered that during the Renaissance quite a few of them were baptized Jews. I was curious to understand what it was like for a woman raised in the Jewish tradition with no option beyond marriage and motherhood to spend the rest of her life in a convent. I wanted to find out whether entering a nunnery could become a desirable alternative or perhaps a quest for spiritual perfection. In fact, the results of my research show that most converts did not choose to enter convents, but were pushed into it by their fathers when their families converted for economic reasons to save on their dowries. It turns out that the dowry required for becoming the bride of Christ was only about one-fifth of that needed for marrying a regular guy. So one of the early cases of baptized Jewish nuns that I unearthed in the archives was that of Sister Theodora, the daughter of a former Jew. And I was curious to find out more about the circumstances of her conversion and discovered that her father was one of the two most famous Jewish artists of the Italian Renaissance, Salomone da Sesso. And then the question arose for me, why did this man convert? He was already an extremely successful goldsmith and sword engraver. His Judaism had not held him back. The greatest connoisseur of the Renaissance, Isabella d'Este, even said of him that he was molto virtuoso, very able in his craft. This was the highest compliment an artist could aspire for. And when we look at Renaissance painting portraits, we can see the kind of jewelry that he was making, and we get a sense of this Jewish artist's contribution to the creation of the bling culture that became a hallmark of the Italian Renaissance. So the positive side of the Renaissance is that a very talented Jew could get to these places and partake in the innovative cultural achievements of that time and at that level. 
But the question remains, why did he convert? I embarked on extensive archival research, scrutinizing documents in eight different Italian archives in Bologna, Mantua, Modena, Ferrara, Florence, and Rome. What I discovered is that Salomone's conversion was a coerced, not a voluntary one. The story of this man was a window for me into the phenomenon of religious conversion. Now, it is important to remember that the conversion of Jews was regarded as the greatest conquest for Christian authorities. It was far more important than the conversion of any other non-Christian group. Salomone converted in 1491, very shortly before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. And when we think about conversion in this period, we often think about the forcible mass conversions that occurred in Spain and Portugal in the face of pogroms and threats of expulsion. But there were also efforts to convert Jews in other parts of Europe. In my book, which is coming out this fall by Harvard University Press, my research for the first time tries to unpack the phenomenon of religious conversion in Renaissance Italy. I do this by asking, how did conversion affect the lives of Jews who became Catholics? How were converts received by Christian society and how was their conversion perceived by other Jews? The main difference between Italy and Spain is that there were no mass conversions in Italy. The individual nature of Italian conversions has led scholars to assume that they were mostly voluntary, but my study exposes their coercive dimension. What I found is that many conversions were undertaken following judicial condemnations in the hope of avoiding painful public executions or cruel bodily mutilations. Most of the Jews who converted in such circumstances were men who were required to secure the baptism of their wife and children. The individual nature of these Italian conversions has led me to choose a micro-historical approach. This is a methodological approach that is based on the close reading of documents that reveal the individual details of general phenomena. Such microscopic investigations make it possible to explore factors that cannot be observed at broader scales of analysis. So my book is the first microhistorical monograph to trace the um, unique traits of Jewish conversion in Renaissance Italy by illuminating the um, different aspects of the life story of Salomone da Sesso, who, because he was such a successful artist, left behind a longer paper trail than did most converts. For example, um, I discovered that Salomone actually converted following a condemnation for homosexual relations. He was sentenced to death, but was offered the opportunity to save his life by agreeing to be baptized together with his entire family. Up until now, most studies of converts have analyzed texts that they wrote to endear themselves to church authorities, texts that tell us mainly what their Christian patrons wanted to read. But in Salomone's case, I uncovered informal evidence on why he converted, what his life looked like both before and after his baptism, and what conversion meant for his wife, his daughters, and his sons. Just to give you some examples, I found records of 48 kosher meals that he ate. I found the payment records for 48 kosher meals that he ate while he was still a Jew and was away from home on business, reflecting his observance of Jewish dietary laws. Yet upon his baptism, Salomone assumed the name Ercole dei Fideli, meaning one of the faithful, to signal his transformation into a pious Catholic. Documentary evidence records that he worked on Shabbat, that he sent his daughter to a convent, and that he received grant commissions for religious works that Jews were barred from creating. His sons followed his lead and became a successful goldsmith working in the service of his aristocratic patrons. Eager to showcase the success of their conversionary policy, these patrons also selected another one of Salomone's daughters as a lady-in-waiting for Ferrara's duchess. Yet the last document that I uncovered from 1521 attests to the enduring enmity of local Jews towards Salomone 30 years after his baptism. 
as this source reveals, the lingering shadow of converts' Jewish past never ceased to haunt them. So Salomone's life story sheds new light on the Italian Renaissance by showing both the extent and the limitations of Jews' contribution to the creation of its culture, and by exposing the repressive and fanatical dimensions of a society that was, in fact, far from secularized. I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the Kadar family and the Naomi Prower Kadar Foundation for the recognition of my work and of the importance of unveiling these lesser known aspects of the Renaissance. Hi, uh, my field is called behavioral economics as uh, it's on the border between psychology and economics. It's basically a modification of classic economics that takes into account that people are not machines. They have cognitive limitations, they have limited foresight, they have self-control problems. For example, people don't plan well, they spend too much money and they don't save enough for retirement. We also have plenty of evidence that even when they plan things, often they don't manage to implement them. For example, uh, people buy gym membership for a whole year and attend the gym only once or twice during their year. It happened to me last year. <laughs> so uh, behavioral economics just uh, modifies the existing models to try to take into account such phenomena. I always understood that uh, psychology is very important in economic decisions, and I'm proud to be part of the behavioral economics uh, revolution that, that Israel is becoming prominent in this field. So in my work, I study how people make decisions in various contexts, but today I would like to focus on the context of strategic situations. So what is a strategic situation? Many of the decisions that we make in real life are just individual decisions that do not depend on what other people are going to do. So for example, when I go to the supermarket and I would like to buy a cheese, all I care about is my taste and how I trade off price and quality. It doesn't matter what other people are going to do. In contrast, when a company needs to price its cheese, it has to think about their competitor's price decision, right? Because it will affect its profit. The fact that the outcome for the company depends on what the competitor is going to do makes it a strategic situation. And strategic situations are much more complicated because of the need to predict what someone else is going to do. Especially if it's a new situation and I don't have data to rely on on the past behavior of my uh, competitor. So, uh, generally speaking, classic economic models are not successful in predicting what people are going to do in strategic situations. So the company, the cheese company, has no economic model to rely on when it has to make its decision. I study through experiments how people predict other people's actions, and I try to develop more realistic models, behavioral models, that are based on this experimental evidence that maybe we'll be able to predict how people behave in such uh, situations. Uh, so let's start with a game, and then I'll show you the, uh, an example of such a model. So think about two players. Each of them need to decide simultaneously about a number between 11 and 20 dollars. A full amount of number between 11 and 20, and each of them write it on a note simultaneously. They hand me the notes, I look at the notes, and I give each of them the amount of money written on the note. This is why it's called the money request game, because they get the money for me. But in addition to the fact that they get the money that they request, if one of them asks for exactly one dollar less than the other one, exactly one dollar, then he gets a bonus of $20. So it's a bit similar to the pricing decision of the cheese company because each player would like to set a price that is just slightly lower than the competing company to steal all the customers, but not to set a price that is uh, too low. Right? It's a simple game. Think for a second what you would do in such a game. We let the Tel Aviv University students play this game for real money. You can see here the results. These are the options that they could choose. And these are the proportion of students that chose each option. So for example, look at 18. 30% of the people chose 18. More than 30% chose 17. In fact, 80% of the choices are around these four choices of 17, 18, 19, and 20. That's interesting. We also ask the students to explain their choices, and this is what they say. Some say that they choose 20 because it's the highest safe amount that they can get there is uncertainty regarding other people's choices, so at least they get 20, 
and they will not get the bonus. Some people say that they choose 19 because they believe that other people will instinctively, intuitively choose 20. So those that choose 19 actually believe that they will get the bonus of the $20. They will get 19 plus $20 of bonus. So they make one step of reasoning, believing that other people are intuitive. But some people choose 18, believing that other people choose 19, because other people believe that other people choose 20. So note that those that choose 18, they believe that they are one step ahead and that they will get the bonus of the $20. They make two steps of reasoning, believing that others are only making one step. And those who make three steps of reasoning choose 17. They believe that others choose 18 because they believe that others choose 19 and so on. So this is the third step of reasoning. And it's very interesting that almost all people stop after these three steps and don't perform a, a more, a more steps. It's not cognitively demanding to continue, right? After I understand that 17 is beneficial against 18, I also understand that 16 is good against uh, 17, and 15 is good against 16. I understand that. It's not a problem. But I stop. Why do I stop? Probably people don't think that other people make more than two steps. And why is that? We actually don't know. But it's probably related to the fact that in real life, in real life conversations and in novels, we rarely see sentences like, I think, that you think, that I think, that something. It's already confusing, so we are not used to thinking of many steps of, uh, of reasoning. So the general uh, model that the results suggest is the following. In a strategic situation, people think about a starting point for reasoning, an anchor. And some people choose this intuitive strategy. In the case of the money request game, it was choosing the intuitive strategy of 20. But most of the people just start from this anchor and then make one, two, or three steps of reasoning. We don't know the exact number of steps that each player will perform in each game. But the fact that we know that the choices will be focused around the intuitive choice and one, two, and three steps of reasoning already narrows the range of the prediction, and that's a lot. So we could use this model to explain many strategic interactions like pricing of products and uh, bidding in online competitions like eBay and uh, allocation of resources in uh, competition. It could be very, very useful. Okay, I'll stop here. I just want to thank the Kadar family and the Naomi Foundation uh, for awarding me the prize and recognizing the importance the work that I do in behavioral economics. And uh, I would like to leave you with one thought. The next time you have to make a strategic decision, first identify what is the intuitive starting point, but don't choose it. Make two or three steps of reasoning and don't go farther than that because sometimes too much sophistication is actually harmful.